Yeah. All right, folks, I think we should go ahead and get started. Maybe you can go in the back door. Okay, yeah, we'll close the front door and get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is the third ever SciComm Lunch and Learn. So this is a series that we just started this semester. And um, Dietram is our third speaker, our third presenter. And we've been really happy with how it's been going so far. We have one more uh, lined up for next month, and then we're going to take a summer hiatus, and we'll be back in the fall. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is... <laughs> um, my name is Jory Weintraub. I work here um, at the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. I'm the Science Communication Director. And um, I, along with my postdoc, Ariana, is she in here somewhere? Ariana Ely, who probably many of you know. Um, uh, Ariana and I started the Science Communication or SciComm Lunch and Learn series this uh, semester as a way to bring interesting voices and perspectives about science communication. Uh, to campus, and um, we've been delighted with the response so far and the turnout, um, and we may need to think about bigger rooms for the fall. Um, I will quickly give a plug for next month, because if I don't do it now, I'll forget. Um, as I said, next month, it's May 10th, um, we'll have our last one for the academic year, and then we'll take a summer break. Um, and it's a guy named Rodolphe Baranju, who's a geneticist at NC State University. Um, who is involved in CRISPR, but has also been served as an expert witness in several science and technology related court trials. And we've asked him to come talk about his experience as an expert witness and how you prepare as a scientist to be an expert witness. So I think that should be a really interesting session as well. So we'll be sending out information. And if you are SVP for today's, then you're on our list. We have your name, you're stuck with us forever, and we will send you information about next month's. Um, also, let me just say that we, um, Ariana and I have been batting around some ideas for the fall, but we haven't invited anyone yet, and we haven't really settled on anyone. So if any of you, there she is, hello Ariana, I'm just talking about you. This is Ariana. Um, if, you, if anybody has ideas for interesting speakers or presenters to come in and talk about some novel aspect of SciComm in the fall, please send us an email and let us know. Um, my email address is just my name, jory at duke.edu, J-O-R-Y at duke.edu. So um, with that, I want to introduce today's speaker, Dietram Schoifele. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to introduce him and have him here today. Um, Dietram is a professor of communication, science communication, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. In fact, he is not just any professor. He is the, I'm going to read it, John E. Ross Professor in Science Communication. So there you go. Um, so uh, Dietram. Is, uh, has a bachelor's degree in journalism from a university in Germany whose name I can't pronounce, so I'm not gonna try. Um, but then he came to the US, fortunately, so I can't pronounce University of Wisconsin, which is where he got his master's and PhD. Did I say that right? Uh, okay. Wisconsin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, where he got his master's and PhD in um, journalism and mass communication. Um, and um, I, he's got a long list of awards, teaching awards, research awards, accolades. Uh, I could take up half his session reciting them, but instead I'm just going to say he's awesome and amazing, and we're super excited to have him here today, and you'd rather listen to him talk about his work than me talk about his awards. So um, I will just say that if you are involved in any conversation anywhere in the world at any time about SciComm, Dietram's name is going to come up probably very early in the conversation. He is, without a doubt, one of the world's experts on the science of science communication and talking about social media and the role that it plays in communicating science and the interface of science and <coughs> politics and policy. And um, when we <coughs> announced that he would be here, um, we the session filled up really quickly. Everybody was really excited to have him. Uh, he's a longtime friend of the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, so we're really pleased to have him. So thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Um, thank you so much for having me back. I, 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 uh, it's always great to be here, this time around in particular because of the weather, because, of course, uh, we still are stuck in winter. Um, and and I, I figured this almost feels a little bit like home now until I walked into the men's room and you guys have a big round table in the men's room in a chair. I really don't know who does work in there. Um, <laughs> office space is so hard to <laughs> no, it's, it's like I, I thought I had answered all the questions or I had done all the questions answered. Um, I want to uh, not spend too much time but talk to um, 
four different things really, or rather quickly, and, and if there's stuff in between that comes up that you feel like asking or pushing back on, the talk is designed for exactly that, A, for interruption, and B, for you to push back on. Some of the stuff I will phrase very intentionally as provocative, and, and um, it's stuff that we can talk about. A, I, I, and I, this is the one I put a question mark next to, uh, are we in a new era for science? Is, it, is, is there something novel and, and about the challenges that we're facing right now? And I would argue there is a bunch of novel things that we should be talking about. Um, I want to talk about the big paradox of science communication um, that especially STEM scientists have a hard time with, that, that science communication happens to be the one area that most of them are not scientific in, meaning they're, they go with intuitions and what they think works, which none of the other areas of work they would find acceptable for, but for science communication apparently not using the best available evidence um, is is one of the things that, that's fine. How all, the way we, all of us function, meaning human nature, why that makes things more complicated. And I'll just touch on a few things. Uh, certainly this will not be exhaustive, and then I'll leave you with a couple thoughts on how we can move forward. So what do I mean by a, 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 a unique set of challenges or new era for science that, we're, that, we, uh, that we might be in? So A, I think, most breakthroughs that we're dealing with right now, and AI certainly, or if you listen to DeepMind, what they call AGI, so artificial general intelligence, um, or CRISPR, um, these new types of genome editing uh, that, that, that allow us to make safer, more efficient edits to a whole range of plant animal, uh, plant animal, plant animal and human. <laughs> I need to remember that word. That's actually not a bad word. Um, but 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 all of them have something in common. That is, it's super complex science that most of us, including those of us who are experts in some areas of science, will never understand. Uh, this is a, a longhorn beetle where scientists turned off, off one genetic marker to get rid of the horn, and that happened. So a very easy edit. Um, but it also grew a third eye, um, getting to the point of off-target effects in CRISPR, right, that we know very little about, but about how even one single marker, let alone combinations of hundreds of, of genes, um, turning them off and on will, will make um, a difference. The problem with that highly complex science is it moves unbelievably fast. Most major metro police departments in this country, including LA, Chicago, are using AI already and artificial intelligence to identify pre-suspects. So in other words, they use location data from your phones, they use social network data, um, and if a friend of yours has gotten arrested in a particular type of crime in a particular location, you're much more likely to get pulled over, um, um, interviewed, and so on and so forth. So we're using a technology that most of us don't understand already and, and on the ground uh, in ways that certainly raise some questions around ethics, legality, regulations, and so on. So that bench bedside is not just what happens in the lab and when it ends up in our, in, our, uh, in our medicines, but it's also things like AI that are being developed in industry and elsewhere being used in law enforcement and other things. That raises exactly what I was talking about, these, these ethical, legal questions in the Human Genome Initiative a long time ago, the DOE used to call this LC, ethical, legal, social implications. Um, a, ethical because they challenge our values belief systems. This is work that's done at the Salk Institute in California where we're using pig embryos injected with human stem cells to grow tailored organs that hopefully at some point will be used in, in transplantation and, and for organ transplants rather. Um, you can see the ethical questions of growing human organs and using, using human stem cells um, in, in, in pig embryos. You can see the religious questions for a Muslim patient for instance who might not be able to accept an organ that was grown in a pig embryo, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I happen to be a person who's not religious, um, so I have very few, very little infrastructure in that respect, mentally, but I can see the moral questions, even as a non-religious person, that that raises. Most importantly, though, and this is the one, if you remember nothing from this slide, this is the most important thing. Most of the questions, the larger questions, societal questions that are brought to science about emerging science have no technical answers, or not just technical answers. Meaning science will not by itself be able to answer those, those challenges. Um, Self-driving cars in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the most deregulated markets, you'll see them all over the place, more than once have run over people. Not because the neural networks didn't recognize them as people, they ran them over anyway. So, you can already see the problems. Can we sue an algorithm? Who is responsible for this? 
Um, can you hack this car? And people at Carnegie Mellon have, have created the stop sign that most of us would recognize as a stop sign that would stop the car, all of us hopefully. Most self-driving cars will recognize this as a 45 miles an hour sign, which you can see is, might be dysfunctional at a, at a four-way intersection. Um, so they can, it's not even just a matter of hacking the software, it's simply putting a bunch of stickers on the sign. And then most importantly, of course, and I know you've thought about this yourself, um, but we're selling at some point parents as they're buying a car for their children a product that is designed in a very narrow slice of circumstances their child. Right? The car is going to make moral choices. It's going to either crash into a class of kindergartners on the sidewalk or an, an elderly couple that's crossing the street at, the, at, the, at an intersection or it's crashing the driver into the wall because that's the best moral choice given the circumstances. So for the first time we're actually selling a product that is designed to potentially kill the user and that's going to make that choice based on an algorithm that is programmed and trained by humans at MIT or wherever else. So you can already see how a lot of these questions are, have, if we should do this, how we do this right, how we do this in a responsible fashion, are, are not just technical. technical. <laughs> so that's, that makes it even more surprising that a lot of the work that we have done in science communication, and I think it's, it's getting better for, for a lack of a, of a more appropriate word, um, has been so unscientific. And it's been unscientific for all the right reasons, but unfortunately with very detrimental consequences. All the right reasons is, uh, refers typically to the idea of a knowledge deficit model. So this is something that I, I, I would like you to remember the term and then to never use it again as a concept. Um, knowledge deficit basically says, and um, I'm maybe fairly, maybe unfairly put um, uh, Bill Nye the science guy there, aside from the fact that that um, having an old white guy in a, in a bow tie playing a scientist on television may not be the best role model in the first place, I'm just saying that. Um, but more importantly, he basically stands for the knowledge deficit model. What he's saying is, you guys don't understand the science, and if you did understand the science the way scientists do, you would make better choices. Right? That's basically what the knowledge deficit model says. So as a result, science communication for him and for a lot of people who believe in that model is about educating the public. Here's where the problem comes in. The problem is that it actually doesn't work. There are dozens, probably hundreds of studies by now that have tried to link higher levels of information to more support for the scientific enterprise. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And in many cases, the most highly informed members of the public or of different publics are actually the ones who are most opposed to certain areas of science because they understand it really well. The reason I put um, this image here is because some people refer to this as the zombie of science communication. It doesn't matter how many empirical studies you drive through its heart. Um, it'll come back every time. And it's partly for good reasons, right? Because it should be true. I want it to be true. I want education and information to be linked, not education, it's the wrong term. Uh, information to be linked to more positive views towards science. Unfortunately, that's not always true. Let me show you one where it's not true and where I think we step into into metaphorical landmines all the time. So what we did, and this is, we do this in surveys all the time, we basically give people a, a, a knowledge test. So we give them short uh, sets of questions, true, false questions, they can answer right or wrong, and then we add up how many of these can you answer correctly, how many you can. So we don't ask you how much you think you know, which a lot of surveys do, we really measure what you know. These are people who know a lot, these are people who know little. And this is attitudes toward embryonic stem cell research. So this is a few years ago. This is uh, when it's still a little bit more uh, in the public eye. Um, this is what the knowledge deficit model looks like right? for the less religious folks, uh, which typically means almost all non-religious. Um, so if you split the American public, it counts. So the more you know or the more you learn, the more positive your attitudes get, at least slightly. Right? So this overall support. But if you look at the highly religious group, and I'll show you later how, how large a proportion of the US public that is, um, it largely flatlines. So the answer, of course, is, well, these people don't get it, right? No, these people did get it. They just answered all the questions about embryonic stem cell research correctly. They understand the science. That doesn't mean the science necessarily fits what, where their value system is and how that translates into attitudes toward research. Back to my point about a lot of the questions surrounding modern science being questions where technical 
information. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. You said that you were testing them. Were you testing them on general science knowledge or specifically things like this? Was specific for embryonic. Um, it, um, it unfortunately holds for general as well. not in this data set, but we, we do it on both. But in this one, it's embryonic in particular. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Can you also explain a little more about the scale? I see it's a partial axis there. Um, and yeah. like, it, is this generally supporting? Like, what, at what point is it lack of support versus pro? Yeah. So the the, the scale is, and that's important. The reason why the why it's only um, a, a partial thing of the scale is there's a whole bunch of this. The model is a much larger model, right? We want to know how old people are, what their gender is, mm -hmm. what their ideology is. A whole bunch of other things, and at the end, we, we test only the interaction. So what I'm plotting here is really only the two-way interaction, um, only the interaction between these two variables, controlling out for everything else in a larger survey model. The reason I'm only showing you this is so you can see kind of where the where the effects are, um, and the the only the only significant slope is this and not the other one. So that's that's the reason why I wanted to to indicate that. The thing, unfortunately, um, uh, the same phenomenon holds. Um, even for issues let, that are less politicized, let's say nanotechnology, for instance, where you see some of the same thing, and it becomes even more, as Dan Kahan at Yale and others have shown, it becomes even more extreme when you look at things like vaccines or climate change. So, in other words, where where, um, the, where values are even more more directly integrated. Uh, but both very good questions. So, why am I highlighting this? Well, partly because of where the U.S. is, and some of you may have seen these data before. Uh, these are data from Pew um, um, folks at Michigan and, and at Harvard have collected similar data. So down here is an admittedly in, imperfect indicator of how developed the country is with the GDP per capita. Uh, and then here the percentage of the population itself ident ident identifies as highly religious. Again, you, there are different ways of doing that, the Y and the X, um, but this is just one way. Uh, you see up here Pakistan, you see Senegal, Nigeria, Uganda, and so on. So typically the idea is the more developed a country gets, uh, the, the, the more secular it tends to be. Uh, and down here you see Australia, you see Canada, Germany, Britain, Japan. There are two countries that are literally off the chart, and you've, chart, and you've probably seen it already. China is down here, and then of course the US is up here. Right? We're, we're literally off the chart compared to every other country, and you can see how, how violating that particular value may be a problem. Um, and this is where I want to turn the spotlight a little bit on the scientific community. <laughs> this is a tweet that Neil deGrasse Tyson posted on Christmas Day. Um, on this day, long ago, a child was born by the age of 30 would transform the world. Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. <laughs> Funny, exactly. <laughs> Trolling Christians on Christmas Day <laughs> <laughs> is not the, the way to open hearts and minds. Right? And, and, I'm, and I mean that actually quite seriously. Um, and, and again, I think it's super funny, right? I, but I also told you, I'm not religious. And so, I'm not the problem who's going to oppose, or I'm not the person who's going to oppose a technology based on religious grounds. But that's exactly the group I want to communicate with. I want to have a meaningful conversation about embryonic stem cell research and basic research using embryos with that group. Um, and then, of course, we have Michael Mann, climate scientist, who last year got the uh, Outreach and Engagement Award from AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, who routinely tweets, on, he's one of the leading climate scientists in the country, uh, that anybody with an R, meaning every Republican in Congress, is not safe to have there. Again, I want to have a conversation with conservatives about climate change. They're my target audience. I want to have a meaningful exchange that is informed by the best available science. This is not true. And then my favorite, of course, and I think more people will agree with this one, Richard Dawkins, um, probably not the person who, who, who you want as your spokesperson speaking about embryonic research and connecting with people, because of course, why would you even worry about the morality for surrounding, surrounding uh, uh, fetal research? And again, I'm being flippant, and I told you I would be intentionally, because I think all of these people are, are well-meaning, are, 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 are really important voices, and so on and so forth, so I don't mean to, to, to overstate the case, I'm just trying to, to illustrate the, the problem. Because all of that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, on the question of religion, do you also think that uh, when you're looking at those countries, a lot of them also tend to have one prominent, even within the subsection of Christianity, Absolutely. one prominent subject, su subsection in uh, contrast to the US, which has many different subsections, yep. which makes it more difficult to engage with the religious leader. So for instance, with the instance of Zika virus um, and contraception, um, with a lot of South American countries, the Pope spoke uh, about the importance of using contraception, and that made a really big difference in South American countries that are heavily Catholic, uh -huh. whereas the United States, <coughs> there's such a wide uh, variety of 
types of Christianity and types of uh, religious groups that it might be more difficult to, that makes it an added layer of difficulty? Absolutely, and I, I, so in addition to your, to your Zika example, um, I'll mention CRISPR as well. So when we did, um, I was on the, on the National Academies Committee that issued a report on the, on the governance and, and scientific prospects of, of human genome editing. Um, and we try to engage with a wide variety of faith-based communities, uh, which A, already was difficult, kind of who do we include, who, who do we bring to the table, but number two is it's the diversity of, vo of voices was truly surprising, right? Where, where even within Christianity, you have very different takes on is this really curation of innovation? Are you just curating what, what, what the creator has given us? Or is this violating what creation is in the first place because we're beginning to, humans are making tweaks to what, what God has given us. Um, so I think that's an issue that pushes us even further where um, where you have to have, and then Zika I think is a really good one where you, where you, because the, the Pope as a, as a science communication intervention almost, right? Um, may be very effective in some places and, and not at all in the market like the US. Germany actually where I grew up and spent most of my life still uh, is similar where the Pope speaks to half of the faith-based population and not the other half, but even that is much more simple than what you have in this. So yes, wholeheartedly agree with you, and I think it will get even more complicated for issues like this as well. Um, so, and, and of course, I mean, almost you set this up perfectly because human nature on top of that makes things even more complicated. Um, and, uh, and, and because of course all of us are, are imperfect information processors, and we've known this for, for a long time. We've known since the 50s in psychology, Leon Festinger, the idea of selective exposure, but selective exposure, and I put, I put the flipboard here intentionally, has been put on steroids in an internet age, right? Mm -hmm. Where I used to, we, we very often talked in, in communication research, and even in the, the 80s, we still talked about selective exposure and attention. I go through a newspaper, I may not like the headline, but at least I know it's there. Right? I know that the story has been written. I may not read it, but I may not attend to it in selective attention, but I've at least been exposed to the idea. If I'm a liberal and I don't want to see any conservative news, I don't have to anymore. Um, a, because Flipboard and all these places allow me to self-select out as much as I want to, but there are layers of social, meaning my social networks around me, surrounding me, my, the algorithms that come with it, and I'll talk about it in a second, uh, that will filter this even more. That I don't want to focus on here, but I want to focus on is this. And I want to show you these two pictures um, because this one is George Bush 43 holding a snowflake baby or what they call a snowflake baby at the time. So these are, these are leftover embryos from IVF that sometimes are used for embryonic research, uh, sometimes they're destroyed, and sometimes under the Bush administration, they're adopted by other parents who choose to have them implanted and carry them to term. All of us look at this, this again, this could, be, could have been used for embryonic stem cell research, or it could have been brought to term by, by, a, by a family, by, by a couple. Um, and we all see, we're all torn, right? We can all see where the, where the thing. We all have seen Michael J. Fox talking about the importance for embryonic stem cell research for curing Parkinson's and, and speaking powerfully in campaign ads and elsewhere. So the point being, most facts have two sides. Motivated reasoning is an explanation from psychology that we actually developed in political psychology to figure out how Republicans and Democrats can look at the world so very differently even though they see the same facts. So it's not that they select different things, even when they look at the same facts, they look at them differently. Let me illustrate this, if I put in front of you 10 facts, 10 cards in front of you, we all agree those cards are true, cards about any scientific issue. We will all weigh more heavily, oops, weigh more heavily, and that's what's called confirmation biases, pilot this again, way more heavily those facts that fit our priors, our prior beliefs, our prior values, and we will discount or weigh less heavily, even though we acknowledge them to be true, disconfirmation biases, those facts that don't fit. The reason we do this is to protect our identity, right? Because we, we strongly believe that, I mean, if you, if you watch Barr's testimony this morning, his press conference, we all read different things into it, right? It was either way too pro-Trump protecting the president or it finally vindicated the president, mm -hmm. even though we watched the exact same press conference. Um, and what happens, and this is where the problem for science comes in, biased assimilation is the process that, that is really the most pernicious one. Why? Because it says we assimilate scientific facts in a biased fashion into our belief system rather than the other way around, right? You would hope that I'm adjusting my belief system all the time as new information comes in. Instead, I reinterpret information to make it fit my belief system. So that's what makes motivated reasoning so 
so problematic because in, 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 in either scenario, um, I will interpret the same facts in different ways depending on what my prior views are or my prior views. <laughs> so that's where motivated reasoning is really problematic. Wisconsin, of course, we live in a gigantic liberal bubble in the university, um, and they call it, I don't know how many square miles, surrounded by reality. Um, and I think most other places I was at Cornell before is exactly the same way at Ithaca and the rest of upstate New York are just as different as they could be. Um, when Scott Walker, our previous governor, uh, took 300 million away from the UW system to give it to the Milwaukee Bucks, um, which I understand is a basketball team. The, uh, the, uh, a lot of people at the university said, oh, he doesn't, you don't understand. He took this matching money away that we had for biofuels research for a big DOE center grant. How does he not understand that this is positive for the state? This is, this is positive economic influences on, on the state's economy. Well, we had a, a, a survey in the field at the time, and this shows you a, a, a more extreme example of what I showed you earlier. Uh, we looked at what happens when we give people more information. What happens in this motivated reasoning kind of way? Um, do they, um, so this is them paying attention to, to news about biofuels and, and, or science and, and, and politics more general. Actually, this is a, a broader measure. Um, and then here on that scale, we basically plot, do you see net positive influences on the economy or net negative influences on the economy? Well, if you're a Democrat, the more you learn, the more excited you get about biofuels. Um, if you're a Republican, you can already see the white spaces, right? Um, this is what happens. Neither one of them is making the right interpretation. Um, neither one of them is, is taking away the only correct way of looking at it. They both engage in motivated <laughs> reasoning. They basically see out of those news what they want to see, either because they're selective or they motivatedly reason their way through it. Number one. Number two is this group. The most highly informed are the ones that are furthest apart. They're the, the most mm -hmm. polarized. Echoing most research that other people have done in this field, meaning very often the most highly informed people are the ones who end up on opposite ends of the scale because they basically have the most developed set of priors, of prior beliefs, values, ideological views. So as a result, they, they self-sort um, even further apart. Um, Dan Kahn has shown this um, at Yale. Others have shown the same thing. So you can see how simply putting more information in front of people very often produces um, problematic outcomes. And this is what I, what I already teed up earlier. All of this is, is, is exacerbated by two things. If you talk to Laura Helmuth, and she was just in my class this semester, she, Laura Helmuth is the science editor of the Washington Post. She spoke to my grad class. Um, and she was saying, well, most of her job, or a good chunk of her job now, is A-B testing of headlines, right, for science stories. Meaning, you have five headlines that go live, and within 10, 15 minutes, they know which one has, been, has the most engagement in terms of being forwarded, shared, retweeted, has the most engagement in terms of clicks, how much time spent with a story. And so all of a sudden, that story, that headline becomes the, the key headline and it determines placement and so on and so forth. Um, and you know this because every time you see, search for an article um, with a headline that you saw somewhere, you may find the Google result has a slightly different headline. That's because basically that's what they ended up going with or that's the one that was cached by Google when it first, when it first went out. So the whole idea that most content, a lot of content, is now not driven by editorial choices the way it was way back when, but it's driven by our interests. Think about those polarized groups, the people who really care about science and the people who really don't care about science. Economically, it makes a lot more sense to give the people who don't care about science less and less science and to give the people who care about science a lot more and more science. So this is what we mean by algorithms as editors. Seven out of 10 Americans now get their news from Facebook. Um, or from some form of social media, rather, at least on a semi-regular basis. Doesn't mean they don't turn to other news outlets as well. But all of us routinely see shared content on our Twitter curated timeline, unless you really went through and actually set it back to chronology, right, which none of us do. Um, same thing for Facebook. None of us actually have a chronological timeline. Most of us have a curated one, which means if two people in this room have the exact same friends, not the same types of friends, the exact same friends, we're still not going to get the same timeline. We're not going to get the same articles in the same, in the same order or even with the same prominence. Why? Because we Facebook stalked different people at 2 o'clock in the morning when we came back from the bar, because we follow different uh, you know, other news outlets, because we're in different locations, we use different hardware, and so on and so forth. So in other words, we went from a system, what we used to call broadcasting, and we all know that term, right? Basically, a few newscasters sent news to all Americans to narrowcasting, which means now we're basically taking the vast majority of the vast 
space of available news and we're tailoring it not just to segments anymore but to individual consumers. I always use baseball as an example because I just don't deeply do not care about baseball. No offense. And I think you have to grow up with it. I, I watch soccer games that end 0-0 and I'm really excited. That's equally pathological. <laughs> but the thing is baseball for me it makes no economic sense for, to give me a baseball story. I will immediately go somewhere else. Right? So if you want me to stay on your platform don't give me what I don't watch. And of course all these sites know this full well. So I don't even know when the World Series or whatever the thing is called at the end starts, because I just don't get any updates on it. Um, the point being of all of this is, of course, that, that it's not going to get better. This is Jim Vandehei, who used to write for the, uh, for the Washington Post in a very traditional, um, bless you, in a very traditional um, writing role. He then um, is also a UW grad, and so he at some point also came to my class when, just when they started Politico. So he started Politico. And he basically said, oh, if that doesn't work out, I'm going to be poor, or if it works out, I'm going to be rich. Well, it turns out Politico did work out. So he became rich, and he then started Axios, which some of you may be subscribing to this very short, tailored news service. This is what he told the New York Times um, on where news is going, and I think it's absolutely right. We will produce news that people want to see, and we'll spend little to no money on things that people don't want to see. Um, and apply this to science now. In, in surveys, when people have pressure to say that they really care about science, we basically, uh, about 15% of us, 15, 1, 5, tell surveyors that we really care about science content. That's when we think we have to say yes. Uh, now you don't have to say yes. I know what you clicked on. I know how much time you spend on your iPad and, and whatever else on your Facebook feed. Um, so in other words, we're, we're going to a world where that's going to be more and more of an, of an economic problem. So I want to quickly talk um, about three solutions before, or either two or three, depending on how long I take for the first two. I may skip the last one. Um, most important one is how we talk about technologies may sometimes matter more than what we actually talk about in the first place. Um, this is one of the most successful communication campaigns ever in the history of, well, that's not it's not superlative driven like a politician, but this is a very successful communication campaign. Why? Because it gives you zero facts. <laughs> Absolutely none. All it does is it adds the word Franken, Tony the Franken Tiger, Franken food, genetically frosted figs. It adds one word to the term food or whatever else. Why is it so successful? Because it basically, and, um, and this is uh, when J. Greg Venter in 2010 inserted synthetic DNA into a live bacterial cell and did what he called create life in a lab. Uh, most people say he jump-started life in the lab, but you're saying Frankenstein in a test tube, right? Why does this work so well? It works well because I'm basically taking a super complex set of scientific breakthroughs of synthetic biology, genetically modified crops, organisms, and I'm connecting it to a mental schema that we all have, right? This is how we process information. A new information comes in, I put it on a mental shelf. It's, oh, it's just like this. I tie it to basically existing nodes. That existing node says, what does Frankenstein say? This stuff that doesn't belong together. Dr. Frankenstein puts this stuff together um, um, with a screw and, and scars and whatever stitches. That stuff gets out of the lab. It gets out of control. It has unintended consequences. It's really difficult to bring back into the lab. And it's all done because of scientific hubris, because Dr. Frankenstein thought he could. And I said all of that by adding the word Franken. And I basically completely gave you that framework for, for interpreting this. Um, in 2002, if this moves on, in 2002, um, Daniel Kahneman, who's a psychologist at Princeton, won as a psychologist the Nobel Prize in Economics for work exactly around this, meaning how do we set this frame of reference? Not because it's a tool for misleading, but it's a tool that explains fundamentally human information processing. This, this idea of framing, of presenting and embedding information within a, a, a mental context um, tells us why I should care about a technology in the first place, right? This is why this war metaphors all the time, the, the Republican war on science, we have, we have crop wars going on. It's something, if there's a conflict, you probably need to pay attention. If I want to take the risks, if I see risks in, in, in GM, for instance, genetically mm -hmm. modified crops, why would I take the risk? Um, and, and a framing can tell me why that may be worth it. Um, why Arctic apples, non-browning apples, and so on, are something that is actually one of the most successful um, GM products. Um, and then most importantly, um, why it helps us connect stuff to, to values that matter to us. And this is where I want to come back on not alienating audiences. 
um, and sometimes not using certain words, climate change being one of them. We know that by now, if we use climate change, we're just going to widen existing partisan gaps, uh, uh, partisan rifts. Um, but uh, Mitt Romney and others, when Mitt Romney first ran for president, but since then, I think Bob Inglis and others very successful do this, do this very successfully, when they do talk about global competitiveness, for instance. So not about climate change, but saying, look, um, if you want to be competitive on an increasingly profitable global market on energy, you have to invest in green energy. Not because of climate change, I'm not even going to mention that, but because of global competitiveness, which both Democrats and Republicans can believe in. Or because of, 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 um, of energy independence. Do we really want to fight wars for oil? And no Democrat and no Republicans want, wants to do it. So yes, then you have to engage in, in, in green energy and, and, and basically in, in, in climate change adaptation and, and, and mitigation without mentioning the word climate change. This is the one time, and I mentioned this over, over breakfast this morning, the one time I will agree with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who actually grew up not that far from where I grew up, um, but he posted this a while ago, this is a few years ago on Facebook and, 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 and started a firestorm. He basically said, I don't care if, I agree with, if you agree with my facts on climate change. What I care about is if we can find the commonalities around policies that we can agree on and move forward, meaning can we, can we in, in agree on policies that are, that are consistent with the best available scientific evidence without me having to stand there wagging my finger saying, see, this is why I was right in the, in the first place. And I can see the ups and downsides of that approach, um, but it also avoids a lot of the polarization, the motivated reasoning, and the, and the basically the, the increasing rifts between um, the scientific community and us. I think I'll just do the second one and leave the third one out um, uh, as far as solutions go, because I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time to chat, but I will talk about um, our tribal identities. And when I mean ours, I'm gonna, I mean everybody in this room, uh, most importantly people who, who look like me. Um, this is, a, this is a, a study that I think is one of the most powerful examples of motivated reasoning in the academic system. We all know in the academic system that when both males and female academics, when they write professor, uh, when they write letters of recommendation, when they evaluate grants, when they give salaries to research assistants, tend to favor males over females. Implicit bias. Right? This is undesirable. It's, it's, it's misguided. It's something that's, that needs to change. Lots of research has documented this, that again, both males and females do this. But, not, but males and females react differently when they're presented with the evidence of their wrongdoing. Um, so this is a study that basically presents research on bias to males and females. And what they find, and this is really the kicker here, um, is that when you show male academics research that, that, that people in general engage in, 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 in gender bias, they rate that research as lower quality. So in other words, it's classic, classic motivated reasoning, right? So thank you for the evidence, but I'm not gonna take that into account because it must be bad research because otherwise my worldview is wrong. Bias assimilation. I'm not gonna change my worldview, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically assimilating the evidence into it. So when I say all of us do this, I mean all of us do this. Um, this is not some conservative who doesn't believe in climate change or some liberal who doesn't believe in vaccines or, or GM. This is us. So it's a, it's a, a universal problem. And so some of the work that, that we've been doing, and this is the last slide I'll show you, has been trying to figure out how can we incentivize people getting out of that motivated reasoning that all of us engage in. And there's some really interesting work that Phil Tetlock at Penn has done, um, Michael Goloff at, uh, Mike Roloff at, uh, at Northwestern, and, and we've tried to use this in scaling this up um, on, on social accountability. So we know that, that a lot of the things that we do, we do because the people around us, are, right? I mean, there's no reason why people wear skinny jeans again or why they will switch back or high rise or whatever else. There's no rational reason to this. The only reason we do any of these things or why I'm wearing this, there's also no rational reason, is only because one does it, because of everybody else. We know that solar adoption happens. Somebody in your, in your street buys solar and then it grows out along your street and because your neighbor has it and so on. So can we actually use that social pressure and influence element? So what we do is, what we did is, and, and we're, we're just starting a big NSF grant on this, but this was from the seed data. So we put students in, in an experiment in four different conditions. And this is on a, on a non-polarized issue like nanotechnology and the seed data. And we're basically saying, so you read a bunch of stories, um, um, at the end of this experiment, we're gonna put you in groups and have you discuss this issue with people. Either we tell them that they don't have to discuss, with people who are just like you, they have the same opinions, uh, with people who will disagree with you. So in other words, you will have to defend your viewpoint potentially, or we don't tell them, kind of, you have a discussion, but we don't tell you who the people are. 
So what we're trying to basically, they never have to discuss, right? The, the discussion is completely irrelevant. We, we, we put them in a room to have them discuss so they don't tell their friends that they didn't really have to. Um, but really all we care about is how do they respond to the threat of discussion. And then we let them look for information in a kind of a gated online information environment. So they have some stories that are general news stories, some of them that are science and medicine stories, and some of them get editorials and opinions that show them both sides of the issue. So that allow them to get out of that selective exposure and motivated reasoning. Right? This is where you really want to be democratically. You get the pros and the cons, and you can ultimately be a more meaningful participant in discussions. And then we, we, we basically track their behavior. Where do they go first? How much time do they spend? And I'm just showing you data here on, on, um, on where they go first. So no discussion for the two-sided stuff, but 15, and then all of these numbers for the discussion groups, regardless, are higher than the no discussion group. So just the threat that I will have to talk to somebody else and not just do my own biased little thing gets, gets people higher on the, on the, on the two-sided velocity of information. And this is not evidence. This is really kind of circumstantial illustrations. Um, but then most importantly, the number in the middle, the 38.2, is by far the highest. Right? The people who are threatened with having to talk to other people that, that are different from their, that, will have, that hold views different from their own, again, on a non-polarized issue even, helps them overcome basically some of their biases and what they would otherwise what they would otherwise do. So really promising data that's in many ways consistent with, with, um, with what Tetlock and others have found. The reason we ended up turning this into an NSF grant is that, that we, wanted, we, we are right now working with, with the outreach folks at Wisconsin um, and, and our team at, at, at Wisconsin on, on, on figuring out how we can do this for CRISPR. Uh, back to your religion question from earlier, because CRISPR, of course, is one of those that, what, that is ripe for for both partisan and religious conflicts, right? Partisan in terms of embryonic research, both at the state level and the, and the national level, and then religious, given, of course, the, the implications of, of what we will be able to do on the human side. So can we set up forms of engagement that don't, um, from the beginning, um, polarize? Um, as I said, I have a few more, but I'll, I'll just stop here um, so we have plenty of time, hopefully, still for, for discussion. Does that work? Sure. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> So we have about 15 minutes um, to ask questions of Dietram, and I am going to exercise uh, moderator privilege and ask the first one, because I have the floor. Um, so you mentioned a little while ago that now if you say climate change, people just shut down, right? It's become a, a sort of a trigger word, a trigger phrase. Mm -hmm. Five, 10 years ago, that was, that was what people were being encouraged to use because it was less triggering than global warming, right? And so to me, that's just evolution or adaptation, right? It's, it's constantly going to morph. And if you move to an option that triggers people, uh, is less likely to trigger people over time, it becomes associated with the other. Mm -hmm. And then it, it takes on that negative connotation again. Is, is, there, is that just inevitable or is there a way around that? Yeah, so, so two things on that. Um, I think number one is I think you're absolutely right. We're trying to reframe things all the time. To, to kind of get out of the trouble that the last phrase got us into. I think we're seeing this with Democrats right now, or we have seen this since basically Bill Clinton, but we're seeing it again. We're trying to reframe gun control as gun safety. Right? So gun control, for most of us, connects to Second Amendment, connects to things that most Americans, Democrat or Republicans, actually don't want to mess with. Gun safety triggers mental buckets of children, gun locks, accidents, that most of us think, Billy, you can't register your gun with the FBI and put a gun lock or put it in the safe. So the, if I say safety, there's a different set of attitudes. So same thing, hasn't been super successful, not a lot of traction. Same thing happened with John Holdren when he took over OSTP for Obama. He tried to change the language to global climate, dis or global climate disruption, I think that's what it was. And he was basically saying it's not just change, it's the fact that we're gonna pay more for transatlantic flights because of all the turbulence and all this. This is gonna produce major disruption. And Fox News had a field day with that, right? This is, here's the Obama administration. Um, 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 introducing new Orwellian exactly language to 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 force it all, which in 2019 looks so you know nicely naive. You know, <laughs> yeah, but, but but still, um, so I think number one is I think that there's some truth to that, and it typically is more difficult to reframe than not. I'm gonna on climate. I'm gonna make an argument. I think climate is it's it was never about the term. It was always about the partisanship. Why? And we joked earlier about when I, I went crazy on my undergrad class because they didn't remember the, the, the 2000 election. And, and, and as one 
a guy I see in that case raises his hand is like I was two years old. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, exactly. And so, but that 2000 election is actually important. Um, um, so the Democrats win the, win the popular vote. Um, the Republicans end up winning the electoral vote. Parallels to 2016, anyone, right? So that's number one. Um, if we call Florida twice, which becomes the important state in the same night, um, it drags on for weeks after. Al Gore sues in front of the Florida Supreme Court. He sues in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. There's these recounts. Um, there's anger on both sides. Eventually, the Republicans mm -hmm. think that the Democrats are, are sore losers, hence they assigned sore loser men, Gore Lieberman, who ran together. And the Republicans thought that, uh, uh, and the Democrats thought the election was stolen by a partisan Supreme Court. This is, this, everything was, 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 was as polarized as it's ever been. So what do we do? We take the person who lost that election and who sued in front of the Supreme Court and go like, that is our climate supporter. Person, person. Right? And then we, we, we're surprised. Now, to make, this ma to make matters worse, so then he comes out with a movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Hollywood gives him an Oscar. Hollywood, the fundraising arm of the Democratic Party. They give him an, a Grammy for the best audiobook for An Inconvenient Truth. And then he gets a Nobel Prize, also not an organization that's, used to, that's known to favor Republican candidates. Um, and then we're, we, and, and Bob Inglis speaks to this very powerfully. No self-respecting Republicans, Republican could support anything on climate change that just sounded like the Democrats were trying to get regulations through for an election that they had lost. Um, I think that was from the beginning. This is also why we're the only country that has a problem with climate change, but nobody else has a problem with it, not even weird countries that typically do the same weird stuff that we do, but even they don't. Um, and so I think that's, climate is a very unique issue, um, and the reframing on climate is, is large, in my opinion, largely useless. So that's why I was saying, just not even having the discussion of climate change is real. It's just such a, if we, if we have a president who can literally sit there in 2018, 19 and, and, and argue um, that, that this is a, a hoax that, that, that's meant to weaken the US economy, and I don't mean in a partisan way at all, but th that's just an indicator of, 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 how, of how not salvageable that particular issue is. I think the, the solution, and I think this is where Bob Inglis and others are really good, and, and as, as a South Carolina, was he right? South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. South Carolina congressman who lost re-election to a to a Tea Party candidate as primary when he embraced climate change um, after his son told him he would not vote for him unless he did. Um, I think it, it does it exactly that way, saying, can we can we communicate toward policy solutions that, that we can have to buy in? So um, I just don't think that framing framing is gonna be is gonna be polishing something that's unpolishable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh sorry, I'm, I'm not supposed to call it. Oh you people. can go ahead. <laughs> um, this is my own motivated reasoning in favor of the knowledge deficit understand it doesn't work on a on a population level but do you think it works sometimes on an individual level yeah uh, so and, and even beyond that we actually had this conversation just this morning right because we're, we're talking about you know what kinds of programs and so on to really hopefully get that zombie dead at some point but then you know came around and said look it actually does matter and very often it matters either for certain groups of people um, for certain types of, 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 of issues so vaccines is the one I, I, I talked about this, or, or we talked about this morning. Um, I could say, well, can I get parents to vaccinate their children even though they don't believe that vaccines don't cause, cause AIDS, or that they do believe that vaccines cause, cause autism, meaning they hold an incorrect view, but they still vaccinate. I, I can't imagine that scenario. I think the solution there, they'll have to give up on that misperception, otherwise they're not gonna do it. Um, so sometimes it's actually really important to, to counter that. And, the outcome may not be a more pro-science stance, but it's a, a behavior that, that we need. Um, so, I, and then also, as you say, sometimes for certain people, absolutely true, and for certain parts of, and I, there's never a public, right? So for certain publics, the knowledge <coughs> deficit model is a, is a truly important one. Just to get the irony across, I mean, I just I did a, a 45 minute exercise in knowledge deficit. I'm like, here's all the facts that you guys didn't know. And this is, right? so, so, I mean, and, and hopefully there's some traction there. and, I, and, and so yes, I mean to your point, I think the last 45 minutes were maybe an illustration of that we'll find out <laughs> or not. No, go ahead. You're in the middle. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious, you know, um, is there any effort on a younger levels, well, younger levels of science, so in high schools, mm. of trying to um, incorporate critical thinking into the science curriculum? What, what efforts are being made there? Because So I think there are two things that are 
that are really important in that respect. And one is there was a report from the National Academies on science literacy, um, and and uh, so this was people from education, from communication, and elsewhere. And um, and one of the things that they called for is what they call media literacy. So, uh, and I I just didn't have time to talk about that aspect at all. But one of the problems, of course, that we're having is that I used to have a pretty good set of cues for what is credible information, right? It comes from the New York Times, it comes from Washington Post, it comes from my local science paper. Now we have less than 20 states in the union with newspapers that have science sections, so you know, more than 30 states, you can't turn your local paper and have a, a science writer. So what I need to do now is I need to sift through a large amount of information, some of which comes from legacy media, some of it comes from very credible blogs run by scientists, and a lot of it comes from Jenny McCarthy, and whoever the person is who runs Goop, um, whose name I always forget. Um, <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow, yeah, the, just the, yeah, Gwyneth Paltrow. Right, so, so I, it's not, I'm impressed. That was a, that was a, a very, you know, it's very quickly connected. The, um, the, um, and, and, the, uh, the, and, and so, so what they called for is basically media literacy. So we need to actually train a generation that will grow up. My students, if I ask them in my class, how many of you have a subscription to anything, any news, they don't. I mean, they had to have one to Spotify, maybe, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and to Netflix, but, but not to The Economist, not to The New York Times. So we, we're shifting to whole new business models, and uh, the Jim Van example highlighted that. That's kind of what the business model is. So they'll need a, 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 a level of competency that I never needed when I grew up in terms of sifting through information. So critical thinking, yes, but also where's the best available evidence? Um, so I think that's, that's one large part of it. Um, and then, and then uh, the, as far as the, the critical thinking goes, um, I think that's also where, where uh, the, especially the overcoming our own biases in, in, in motivated reasoning, I think that's where the, where the other thing comes in. What I would argue here, and this is work that my colleague Dominique Broussard has done, um, and we also talked about this this morning, most of it in this room, I'm assuming, how many of you are climate scientists? Yeah, so one, okay, so I'm assuming, and I'm not gonna ask this question, but most, I'm assuming most of us believe that climate change is real. Right? So, how many of us have actually looked at, at all the climate models and the error rates and the whatever else, and the answer is few of us? How many of us have read the primary literature? The answer is few of us. How many of us ever read any of the science section, the gray parts of, this, of, of, of science magazine, and so on and so forth? Still, we believe in climate change. And if I asked you why, you would say because it's true, because the evidence shows that it's true, but none of us have ever seen the evidence, right? So why do we believe in it? Because we believe in peer-reviewed literature, in, in universities, in, in, in objective, neutral ways, in science being the best institution or the best way of producing knowledge. Um, that's what's typically called the cultural authority of science or deference. Um, that's very strongly, and Dominique Broussard's work showed this very strongly correlated to K through 12 education. So it's not that I learned how CRISPR works, or it's not that I learned how, how, how nano works or how whatever works. What I learned is to defer to science and to processes of science um, and that's particularly important when you speak of critical uh, um, uh, uh, thinking skills. If you look at the National Science Board Science Indicators, uh, about a quarter of the American public, if I get the numbers right, and so don't quote me on that, but look it up, you can, in the last survey, know what an experiment is, a random assignment experiment of the U.S. public, which means if I show them a good study or a bad study, it doesn't really matter because they can't tell the difference anyway. So I think that's where some of the, the competencies are really, are really lacking. But I would, those are the two, media literacy and then deference. <laughs> And then some of the things surrounding uh, so, science. So yeah. if I can say just one quick thing Absolutely. on that point. Um, when you talk about the anti-vaxxers, it really started as somebody bastardizing a cultural deference to science, you know, Wakefield and his MMR study. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one example. And the other example is the uh, is the Seralini study, the rat study, and the rat tumors on on on, um, on uh, Roundup and uh, glyphosate um, in water and on corn. Same thing. Where the argument actually in both of them, I think you're absolutely right on. Uh, both of them actually made very scientific arguments because the argument is this went through peer review, this is a top journal, how come it got retracted? If science is working so well, this should have never gotten retracted, it was all industry that forced this. And it's happened for Sarah Lee and it happened for Wayne. So in many ways, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the mechanism that, they, that they're being used for um, is actually weirdly scientific or, or uh, using the scientific. But I, there were a couple, all the way in the back, maybe first. Yeah, um, you talked a lot about how people react to information, and at one point you actually said that education is not the right word to be using to explain this. And so do you see differences in education versus information, and also how would you, going kind of back to this question about literacy, yeah. how would you define education versus information or knowledge? 
Yeah. So I, and that was actually, I'm glad you picked up on that because um, I, I kind of caught myself using education instead of information, and I think those are very different things. Right? You can be highly educated yet under, totally underinformed about a particular area. And, and I mean, my climate change example just now, I think I would argue is a little bit that. I would not consider myself to be highly informed on climate science. Um, I, I, I'm kicking that can down the road and believe that, that or, or I, I defer, I mean, that's the right word here, um, to the scientific, um, to scientific authority. Um, education though, in terms of formal education, I would slice off two things. One, the K through 12 thing that I just mentioned and how strongly correlated it is to deference. And so I think that's where a lot of the value of communication, of, of education comes in. Less in terms of, um, in terms of teaching us scientific facts, right? We're measuring these two tomatoes contain genes and so on. And it's like, we're always surprised how many people don't know how long it takes for the earth to go around the sun and so on. But does that really matter when it, when I have to make a policy choice between uh, you know a Democratic or a Republican proposal? Any answer is it probably doesn't. It ma matters for how often you celebrate your birthday, but that you can probably figure out without science. And so I think that's one thing for 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 education where where it's really important. The other thing for education is science classes, and that actually is one thing that predicts weirdly well various stances on science. So even when I say. Um, uh, when I correlate education with, with, with attitudes towards science, yes, there's typically correlates with trust and more positive attitudes, but it really starts correlating once you measure how many science classes people are taking, regardless of their major, which is why I'm a big believer in, in uh, I'm in the College of Ag and Life Sciences, and, and you know, our students are communication majors, but they'll, they'll still have to take org chem, to their great dismay. But, um, <laughs> but it's not a bad thing, right? It's, it's, it's partly because it gives you an appreciation for a scientific process and fields that is different from your own. Um, and maybe that's me just being the, the European humanist or something because we believe in that a little bit more. Um, but I think that's where the other thing, how many science classes you've taken, tends to be a really good, a really good predictor. And I'm kind of not hitting your question just right, but I, those are the two. I'm not an expert in education, so this is, this is the non-expert view. Um, but I'm glad you picked up on that, on me catching myself on education. Yeah, I think so. we can take one more question. Oh, so you have to make the hard choice now. I just did. So. <laughs> I'm so glad you touched on the, the issue of tone language. Um, I'll try to boil this down. One thing that came to mind as you were speaking was the bumper stickers that I see on the back of people's cars, and you'll see a fish mm -hmm. on the back of a, of a car of someone who's Christian. You'll often see a modified fish, it says Darwin, yeah. on the back of uh, a car of somebody who's pro science. And when I see that, I cringe a little bit because that person who has put the Darwin sign is saying, finger in your eye. Yep. To the religious person, you're saying, I don't, I don't, I don't respect your belief system, mm -hmm. and they're also saying I'm part of this other tribe. Yep, yep, yep. So you know, it's just like all the tweets thing too. Right, so and the so reason I took my computer out is to show you this. But, um, so those of you who are part of the other tribe <laughs> will know exactly what this is about. So, I mean, to your point, this is straight up tribal signaling and, and us versus them. So you're you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and I, this is this is a little bit like the Neil deGrasse Tyson tweet. I know it's funny. I I think it's funny. And DM me that joke, and I think it's very funny. Um, Post it as a spokesperson for science, and it, it doesn't do what you want it to do. It's still funny, I mm -hmm. think, but it doesn't do, and, and this is really where science communication starts, right? What are you trying to achieve? Sometimes I'm just, I just want people to vaccinate. Sometimes I just want them to drive a smaller SUV or no SUV whatsoever. Sometimes I want them to be excited about science. Sometimes I want to, and this would have been the third um, solution that I had about for, portrayals of scientists and what they look like and really depressing data of, of how students in my class, sophomores, see scientists largely as white, male, old, and so on and so forth and what we can do to change that. So I think there are lots of outcomes that we may go for and, and sometimes something that is a great message for one purpose is not evolved to the other. Um, and, and I've gotten more comments on that 0, 0.0 sticker than anything else I've ever had on my computer. As far as my <laughs> so unfortunately we're out of time. Um, please join me in thanking Deep from again Thank for a wonderful so talk. Thank you all for coming. If there's more pizza outside, please take it. Take it all. Enjoy it. Um, we hope to see all of you next month, uh, May 10th, when we do another session talking about science in the courtroom as an expert witness. And Dieter may be willing to stick around for a couple I, minutes absolutely. if you have some more questions. Thank you all. Yeah.